What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Pro V Pro. Big week to talk about the Memorial U.S. Open qualifying. Bobby Max, huge win. But before we get to all of that, I have to give Justin a congratulations and a condolences because his Mavs are in the finals, his Dallas Stars are not. You don't need any more championships, though. You've got the Texas Rangers. Your fun's open. Yeah, uh, it was. It's been a great week. I mean, we literally went every other night. You know, we have something to do. Uh, my liver's going to need a break really soon. This is <laughs> come on, man. Like, what are we doing here? Uh, yeah, no. The stars. The stars. I think that as a whole, we thought they had a better chance of, of winning it all. I think that they felt like the the better team there. Um, even last night, the better team. But man. I would love to know your opinion of Luca because I feel like he's one of those guys that we love because he's on our team, mm -hmm. but man, he can whine and cry and be a baby. And it's just like, and then, and then, you know, everybody said that him and Kyrie would never work. And obviously they put all that to, to silence. Yeah. I think the the coolest thing about the mass from just a, a fan of basketball perspective is the fact that somehow, some way they figured out how to be an elite defensive team with both Kyrie and Luca which is partly because they got both of those guys to buy in, which I didn't think was going to happen in the first place. But then also like they're just pulling a lot more of their own weight than I expected. And everybody else just really completes that team. Well, you're right though. Like I don't think anyone in the history of the game has played a more beautiful style of basketball at times and also a uglier style of basketball at times. Yeah. So we'll, 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 we'll be, it'll be fun to watch. Um, you know, obviously it'll be a big week and then I've got a bunch of golf tournaments. So, I mean, I have us local or USAM locals next Tuesday. So a week from tomorrow and then go straight from there into the Texas state AM. So, um, I have a little bit of tournaments and I haven't got to practice because we've got the wettest Texas in the history of Texas. So all <laughs> we do is watch it rain the, every day. Uh, I'm gearing up for the Vermont open. Both of us should have been playing to uh, playing today at the U.S. Open final qualifying. Obviously, we didn't qualify this year, but we do have some pretty decent uh, experience in that event. For those who don't know, Justin and I actually met about, was it now, like nine years ago at yeah. Canada School? Yeah, 2016, because I think it's the year I got through. So, yeah, it's, it was a while ago. Really similar grind, by the way, Q School and the longest day in golf, U.S. Open final qualifying. So 36 holes today is what – Guys played all around the country trying to qualify for the U.S. Open. Lots of guys, lots of big names made it through. I think the biggest three stories are guys who didn't. Adam Scott missed in a playoff. Uh, he was beat by Cam Davis. He chipped in, by the way, on the on the first yeah. playoff hole for birdie. Cam Davis made a birdie putt on top of him. Then Cam Davis ends up winning. Keith Mitchell, kind of a slow finish in his last couple of holes. Aaron Rye made two birdies consecutively to close his round. He made it. Keith Mitchell did not. And then Joaquin Neiman made a late double bogey down at the Bears Club in Florida. So he missed by one. Out of those three, what's the what's the biggest takeaway for you, if you have any? Uh, well, first of all, uh, Scott's played in like some ridiculous number mm -hmm. of majors in a row. I don't want to be a spoiler, but I'm going to be a little bit. I bet Mitchell and Scott both get in as first alternate somehow. It just seems to happen that way. I don't know why. But it's going to be the same reason. Like, I bet Davis Thompson never thought he was going to get going to get in this week. And then, you know, McIntyre's like, ah, I'm going to go home and party with the boys. And and here you can have my spot in the memorial. So, um, it, you know, a lot of people that don't know how that works, they rank your sites on strength of schedule or, or strength of players. And then they determine their alternates from there. Um, I would bet that they find a way – since they never really released this, I would I would imagine Adam Scott's your first alternate right now. Um, without spoiling it, I would just the way the PGA Tour works uh, and um, the politics of it, right? I, I, I just I, I, he's the only one out of all of the ones that could really move the needle. Um, Neiman's Neiman's not even an alternate, so he, he's gonna he's got no chance, I don't think. Uh, but uh, he's I think he is an alternate. I think he was the the first loser, if you will. Uh, then he had to be in a playoff for it. Um, I didn't see that. That 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 could be right. But let's see. Regardless, you know, I would expect one of those guys to get in, if not a couple of them. Uh, it's just hard. I mean, you, they just, you know, mm -hmm. some of these guys. I think the one that was was most heartbreaking was Goderup, right? I mean, he had a iron into a par five, hit it in the bunker, hit a 
average bunker shot at best and then three putted to not even be in a playoff. If he makes birdies in, if he makes par, he's in a so-called bad playoff, and then and then he makes bogey and he's not even in a playoff. So that was the one that for a guy that's got you know full tour status that that I see that that seemed more heartbreaking, right? But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean at the the thing about Adam Scott is like if he's in the U.S. Open or do, is there a good chance that he's part of our core in either DFS or that we have an outright on him? I mean, yeah. like, it, 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 just yeah. thinking about it. Yep. And we've been using them all year. Same with Keith Mitchell. Uh, you're right, by the way. I I watched my boy Willie Mack actually win the playoffs, so I don't know how I, I forgot about that. But, yeah, uh, Neiman, not the first alternate. He was two under. There was a playoff at three. So you were correct about that one. And, yeah, uh, Scott – I'd absolutely have a chance to be, you know, one of our, our key plays. We've been playing him all year with a lot of success. Obviously, uh, you know, he's had some disappointing rounds, of course. And like, man, Sunday was was one of them in a way. He gets to four under sprinting out there. It looks like he's got a chance for a top 20 finish or something. And then just really struggled down the stretch, including back-to-back bogeys to close. But I'll tell you, the the big, big disappointment for me, the, the gut punch, if you will, was Keith Mitchell missing. Because if you think about the year that he's had, think of, you know, that disastrous round on Sunday at the Valspar where he comes in with the lead and just was, was like eight over or something that he shot and uh, hit a, a poor finish at Colonial for us also in the final round. He's given himself chances to earn this spot without having to qualify, has to go qualify, plays great golf for 32, 33 holes, something like that, and then a slow finish, including a par on the final hole, which was a par five, a gettable par five. So, Man, it, it, it's a it's got to be a gut punch for him, and it seems like he's been feeling that pressure to get himself into the top fifty to qualify for first the Masters and now U.S. Open, all this stuff. Like, wh- where do you think his game goes from here with this disappointment? So I think that we during this episode, you were we 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 did some majors preview, and you <laughs> hinted on, hey, he was like an a uh, an. an an unbelievable number, like 300 to one. And you, I think you encourage everybody that listens to say, Hey, like make sure you know your sports books rules of whether you get a refund of whether he gets, gets in or not. And and it was a question of, is that number that high because he wasn't in yet. And we talked about him earning his way in. Um, It's really weird because he's hard to figure out because he drives it so damn good all the time Mm -hmm. like very very seldom do you just see a huge dip in his driving and yet he still hasn't figured out a way to 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 finish and i i think there's got to be there's an answer right there's something going on with with his body his golf swing when he gets under the gun when he gets a little pressure on him and, and to hit these bad shots and i almost wonder if that's what happened on the par five you know to finish today of like Hey, he just didn't hit a good shot, and he just kind of got nervous. And and because I think he has the he has the attitude of like I belong, right? He doesn't have mm-hmm. the passive attitude that you would think would you know succumb to this the the pressure. But man, there, there's got to be something going on, right? Yeah, I, I so I think I I really don't like his body language a lot of the time, and. On the one hand, like having that fire, that passion can help guys. Like it, you know, he maybe uses that at times to almost energize himself and to battle through it. But I, I tweeted this out a few hours ago. Tell me if you if you think this is a good prediction or just a dumb prediction. Over the next couple of years, at some point, I think Keith Mitchell's gonna go on a winning streak. And after that winning streak, we're gonna come to learn that he's been seeing a sports psychologist and he's gonna credit that sports psychologist for his son's success exactly the way Wyndham Clark has done over the last year and a half. Um, see, I, I, I guess I don't, I, I don't know enough about him to know if that's the issue. Um, but I think there's a lot of guys that have to go through that. The, the, the mm-hmm. thing that's impressive about Wyndham Clark that I don't know that Keith Mitchell will be willing to do is that he accepted Wyndham Clark accepted his issues said, I want to solve these issues and I want to get better as a golfer. And therefore it helped. Like is Keith Mitchell capable of doing that as a person, not as a golfer, but as a person, Mm -hmm. because you have to swallow your pride and say, Hey, I just need help with this. Help me figure this out. Um, 
and to be clear, I think the issue with Mitchell on the course has actually been fairly straightforward. His, his around the green play has been bad for most of the season. It's turned around in the last three weeks. It was good at the Byron Nelson. It was good at the Canadian Open. It was even fairly good at the Charles Schwab at Colonial. Bad at the PGA Championship when he missed the cut. As you said, like his driver's always good. But the other inconsistency is the putter. And he's had three weeks since the players where he's lost over a full stroke per round putting. He really putted himself out of contention at the Byron Nelson, lost 0.64 per round that week. If he has a good week that week when he finished T20, he's in contention. He maybe even wins. This past week, his putting was good. He finished 10th. But even in that round, even in that final round, from holes 9 through 15, he missed five, six makeable putts. So 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, seven holes. He missed six makeable birdie putts, four that he should have made. So, you know, he, he putted still using the start. two ball? Sorry? Is he still using the two ball? Because he went away. Wait, he putted really good with it, and then he went away from it. And I wonder if he went back to it or if he's using something else. I want to say he was using a mallet, but I can't. I can't quite remember. Um, he uh, like honestly, he wasn't on TV that much because he wasn't in contention this past week. It's but. crazy. Because, like I think about that kind of stuff. I know. Like I, I guarantee, there's probably ninety nine point nine percent of the world that doesn't look at a guy and go like, "Oh, is he? What putter is he using? Like, what difference <laughs> does it make? Like, that's just a like I like I just." remember seeing him putt so well in Florida using that two ball. And then it seems like he's had struggles and, and, you know, it's just such a mental mm -hmm. deal all the way around. Um, by the way, I was going to, we were talking about when we, when we first met. So the last event of the Canadian tour was actually played at that cherry Hill golf course mm. that they played in Canada. Yeah. It is like an old, it, it's, it, you know, what it reminds me of is colonial, like a high rough, different yeah. type of grass, but a very colonial, style golf course obviously i think you know it took several under par to get through um but yeah it's pretty cool to see him you know out there competing on a place that that but I, I mean i might have been one of my last competitive rounds as a pro i think i was i was like t5 with eight holes to go and ended up missing the cup by one made like two doubles and i was just suicide watch so um <laughs> the the other thing by the way with mitchell even even in his uh, U.S. Open qualifier today, so he he shot seven under for the two rounds. He made fourteen birdies. I want to say Aaron Rye finished nine under and made nine birdies. It maybe it was even eight birdies in eagle and one bogey or something. And and it's that sort of thing that we see a lot from Mitchell, where it's like he he's just making too many unforced errors, which is another reason why I point to the mental aspect of it because I, I think there are times where it's like he's getting mad at himself for mistakes that he hasn't made yet. And he expects to make later on in the round. It's hard to describe, but I, I do, when I watch him, I see somebody who's not quite as good mentally as he can be. And if he gets that side of the game down, there's, there's no limit to how good his ceiling could be because he's already one of the best ball strikers in the world. Without question, he's already right now, one of the best drivers in the world and this season, his iron play has been significantly improved from last. If you see any like continuation of that iron play improvement, he's the best ball striker or one of the best ball strikers, one of maybe a top five, if you will, in the entire world. Just needs to be sharper on and around the greens and just between his ears. So the mental side of this is, uh, and we've all experienced this round, I, I know you have, is where you, and I think he's experienced several of these rounds in a row, where he's hit a lot of really high quality shots and maybe hasn't made birdie, maybe hasn't made birdie. Then he gets one bad break or hits one good shot that maybe ends up missing the green. He doesn't chip it well enough to get it up and down. He's played six holes. He should be, you know, three under and he's one over and he's just, he's mentally, he's like, what do I need to do? Like I'm done. Like I have no chance. Or he birdies for the first seven holes and then makes a bogey. And instead of being like, you know what, I'm still three under, I'm playing great golf. Let's just get one right back and, and continue to charge. It's like, oh, that one bogey just completely ended his round. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he's sulking, and you can tell his body language is down. And, I, again, like I, I think he's going to figure that out eventually, especially if he starts seeing a sports psychologist. I, I don't know. Maybe he already is. Maybe he's already working on this stuff. Maybe the breakout is, is coming sooner than later. But 
I don't know. I'm a little bit worried that, you know, he's been putting so much effort and energy, obviously, into trying to qualify for this event. Because remember, like the U.S. Open Course Fit Model, the event fit model is so high on driving distance and driving accuracy, a combination that not many people in the world have like he does. So this would have been an awesome major for him. Yeah. And um, I, the other thing that about U.S. Open uh, qualifying today is, I don't know if you noticed that, this, but the the course in Springfield, Ohio, that usually has all the tour pro, pros and usually has several spots, mm -hmm. they only played for four spots today with Adam, the one that Adam Scott was at, okay. whereas the Cherry Hill, the Canada site, took seven. So it, I, I wonder if that, you know, is that a doing of the tour pros of where they sign up to go, or is the USGA trying to even things out and not make some of these fields so so top heavy? Is that is this a um, kind of an effect of the Memorial being less players in the field? So most of the players in the field already are already in the U S open. So therefore they don't have the big local site, you know, right down the road. So it's just, it's an interesting fact to think about. I know I used to try to go to Springfield or Memphis. So um, Memphis used to play the same week as, as U um, S open. So Memphis always had, a huge amount of qualifying spots. So that was always where I tried to go. Yeah. So a, a few things there. I think you're right. It's a smaller field, but also the schedule changed. So they were in Canada. So I, I can pretty much guarantee there are more guys in the Canadian open field that needed to qualify than there are this week at the Memorial. So they just stayed up there. Also the Columbus site is the one that usually has more wow. of the tour. The pros. They just changed the course. Springfield, yeah. Springfield is actually the one that I went to the first two times that I qualified because I played conference championships there. So it, it was cool that, uh, you know, that as I was following Adam Scott and, and that qualifier, like I knew exactly what holes they were playing. So that was, that made it a, a bit more of a, a fun follow, but obviously wanted Adam Scott to get in. Um, man, that course is diabolical, by the way. There are a couple holes where it's like you need to hit your ball within a five yard circle or it's coming all the way off the green and rolling 40 yards away. It's man, at, in conference championships, like the number of triples and eights and nines that we saw, it was just nuts. Yeah. So you're right. They just changed to the Ohio state course mm -hmm. um, in Columbus, but even there, they only had five spots. Yeah. So it's not like they had a ton of spots there. So it just goes to the same thing. Justin Lauer, uh, Shams power, like tour players got mm -hmm. through Brendan Todd. I saw yeah. Luke list barely missed. Um, so there was still, but it's still just not, you know, usually that's a tour event, right? I mean, literally mm -hmm. that, that site is a PGA yep. tour event. Uh, I think historically it's been right after the Memorial, right? Not right before. Um, That could be, maybe that, maybe that, I, that could I, be right. I think that's what it is. So I, I think it's the fact that they, they were in, I think it's a, a dual effect where number one, it used to be right after, now it's right before. And this week, that field is so much smaller than we're accustomed to seeing. So there were, again, there were more guys in Canada playing than there are this week playing that still needed to qualify. So I think that's what was going on. But in any case, uh, pretty exciting day. Always a fun one to follow. And speaking of getting it done under the gun, Bobby Mack, Robert McIntyre, a phenomenal win up in Canada. His dad was on the bag. What did you think of that whole round? I mean, poor start. Is there anybody that that thought he was going to get it back together like that? I mean, if you say you did, like you're kind of like, I mean, you got a lot of good players breathing down your neck. Rory yeah. was trying to make a run, um, and he it, just it's, it, that's exactly what it was. By the way, it's not just that he had a slow start. It's while he had a slow start, they were four to six guys charging at him quickly. Yeah, and, and he just he got it back together and and. Mm -hmm. His dad being on the bag, you know, that's, you know, his fourth or fifth caddy in the last eight events. Like, he's just been going through caddies. Does his dad have a huge part in that? I know you, your dad caddied for you when you won. Do you mm -hmm. think that that was a – you think his dad was like, come on, dude, like, you can handle this? Or do you think that, you know, it was just his time? I'd love to know your thoughts on that. And just – it was super impressive. I mean, anybody that's felt that amount of pressure to get a win and to do that is just incredible. Did you watch the the post game uh, post game post match <laughs> interview that that he he gave where he talked about the fact that like he had been homesick for weeks? 
Yeah, and mentioned his girlfriend was there and a little mm -hmm. bit of that other stuff. Yeah, he. It, it, I watched. Uh, I did watch it and, and kind of just. I don't. I don't know that I have an opinion on it, but I definitely heard all everything they said, and they were pretty emotional with it. So. So my answer to whether or not it helped that his dad was on the bag, I think the answer is definitely yes. And I think number one, it gets to the fact that, like he had been homesick, so that there's like that variable that suddenly is removed from the equation. If your dad's on the bag, you're going to feel a little bit better in that regard. But then also like being in contention is such an unfamiliar feeling that I know that having my dad on the bag in that moment made it feel more like a regular round of golf. It was a little bit easier to execute shots in that regard because it was just easier to say, all right, you know, I'm just playing around a golf with my dad on the bag and not, I'm trying to win the Pennsylvania Open. Yeah. It I, I mean, I guess the comfort level has to be there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other side of that is like, there's a lot of times in my life that I've been more nervous around my dad than I was, you know, any other time. So <laughs> that's also true. You know, there's, but, there's, but to that point, I knew my dad was a hell of a lot more nervous than I was. So that was also a little bit comforting. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I, I hate it because I was a week late on him. I loved him last week. You're, you're the week before. I thought, you know, he was a big part of my core and then, you know, missed the cut. And then he comes back and wins the next week. And that's kind of the the way my year's going, uh, to be honest. I've been one week off on just about everybody. So I'm sure Cam Young wins this week. <laughs> that's also why we really like Bobby Mack, by the way, is, is that week-to-week -week volatility because, yes, any week he can miss the cut, but any week he also has the ceiling to contend which he showed uh, also had a, a great week for us down in Mexico. So at, at least we got him right one of the times, but, but yeah, I, I was worried watching the, watching the post round interview that people would view this narrative like, Oh, he has his dad on the bag or he had his dad on the bag as like a little bit overkill and making more out of it than what it actually was. That that's not what I thought. I, I, I really do think it, it makes it that much more special. Yeah, I mean, anybody that that thinks that has never competed or been in that situation to not think that I don't know, or, or just you have a different home life than I can imagine. You know, I I grew up with just me and my dad, so like I, you know, obviously, like if you've got that relationship, and he, you know, he he hinted that basically the reason he played golf is because his dad loved mm -hmm. golf, right? And so there's a lot to be said about that, and it's 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 fun to watch and he's always been pretty raw emotionally. So like, I don't know how people could just, just, just discard what he had to say. Yeah. I, I also just think that like, in terms of how McIntyre is going to remember that event, it changes what stands out to him. Like for myself, I don't know what, what moments would stand out for me if my dad wasn't on the bag, but because he was, I know that the two moments that stand out for me were when I made like a 15 foot putt to force the playoff in the last hole and my dad just yells, yeah, and gives this huge fist pump. We're right in front of this, like, big patio where people are watching. I don't think that people knew that I was putting for the tie. So, like, there's just, like, this light level of clapping. And then my dad goes, yeah. And my dad, like, says afterwards, he's, like, kind of got a little excited on that one. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then on the fourth playoff hole, I hit a, uh, a seven iron from the rough up the hill. And in the air, my dad goes, Oh, please tell me that's as good as it looks. And I was just like, I think it is. And it ends up being a foot from the hole or something like that. So like, those are the two moments that stand out to me. I don't know what would stand out instead, but I, I know that I'm always going to have those very, very specific vivid memories because it was my dad on the bag. So uh, kudos to Robert McIntyre. He's going to remember that one for his whole life. Yeah. I've, I've only got one experience with my dad the year that I qualified for the USAM. So I'm young, right? It's Oh one. So, you know, I'm 20. Never, I literally never played competitive golf really. Out, I just finished my freshman year of college, Division II college, and I'm in a three for one playoff. And one guy pumps it OB, and then the other guy hits it like 12 feet. And then I hit, I miss the green, I chip it to a foot, but I got to move my marker because I was so nervous, right? So I move it, <laughs> and then the, uh, the other guy misses the 12 footer and then misses the two footer coming back. Well, my dad didn't wait for me to knock mine in to win when that guy, when that guy missed the two footer, he started cheering. Oh, and I was just like, I was just so, I was so embarrassed that he had just, he's cheering about this guy missing. You know, I moved my marker back and tapped it in and I was probably so embarrassed. It made me not think about this, you know, 18 inch butt that I had to play in the USAM. So oh, it man. was like, it was kind of like, 
I love you, Dad. I'm glad you're excited, but don't <laughs> rub it in this guy's face that just three putted to play in a USGA event. So that's hilarious. You and gotta be like, I don't even know that guy. I don't know why he's rooting for me. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was funny. So that's and to amazing. be fair, like we didn't come from a golf family. I didn't I had no idea what mm -hmm. I'd done. You know, I'd only been playing golf like three and a half years. So mm -hmm. like I had no idea what I just achieved at that moment. Right. And my dad didn't really either. But like I said, it's it was just a it was just a yeah. So the dad experiences are good, especially when they're That's genuine. Phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Um, the the other thing I'd say there is just how well, cool is it? McIntyre decides, you know what? I'm not going to play the memorial. I'm just going to go home and have a bender with my dad for a week. Oh yeah, he like the easy like a guaranteed world ranking points, like the easiest, maybe one of the easiest cuts you'll ever make. And he's like, nah. Not only am I just not only am I going home, I'm flying all the way back to Scotland to yeah. hang out with my boys. And then I got to fly back to the U.S. Open. He's passing up on. So, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that's pretty great. Um, all right. Time to jump into the Memorial. Obviously, one of the best courses in the world, one of the best events of the year. I wish it wasn't an elevated event. At least they have a cut. But, man, this course fit model is spectacular. So driving accuracy and around the green play. The, I think the closest comp in terms of, like, just what matters and how much more it matters than usual is actually TBC Sawgrass, which is a weird comp here, but driving distance 25% less predictive than usual, 60% more predictive than usual for driving accuracy, less than a 10% decline on approach play. So uh, also a less than 10% decline on putting. So like both of those matter technically less than usual, but they still both matter around the green play 103% more predictive than usual. When you hear that, Driving accuracy around the green play, who comes to mind? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is how did Victor Hovland win here last year? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, like, I've always been a big Matsuyama fan here. I mean, we're, 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 we're going to go without the Scheffler effect, right? We're just mm -hmm. going to take away the Scheffler effect. I mean, literally, when you come to this week, you hope you get the seventh place finish Scheffler, not the winning Scheffler, like that, if you're trying to beat him. So, um, but Matsuyama comes to mind right out of the gate for me around this place. I've always just felt like he, he should win here. Um, the, the interesting thing about this place and you're talking about how predictive it is, how many repeat winners we have at this golf course. Mm -hmm. It's almost yeah. amazing how, I mean, Cantlay's won two or three times, uh, Tiger won here five times. I think Rose only hit one here once, but he should have won here twice. Um, we've had a ton of repeat winners here. That just kind of shows that it's a certain skill set to always go back to, 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 to win on this golf tournament. Um, I think that, uh, I, I, I mean, Patrick Cantley, it's going to be hard to overlook this week. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know what, how you feel about Cantlay here, but I just think that he's kind of been trending the right direction as well as Victor Hovland. Like, if I'm going to beat Scheffler with the way that it's worked, uh, with Hovland's recent improvement, with the around around the green play getting better, back with the other coach, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I like the looks of that. And and like I said, I think it's just a kind of an identical winner here. So you you made the the joke about Hovland, but I think it's actually like a really good conversation to have because. Number one, we know that Hovland is one of the most accurate drivers in the world. He's been that way for a couple of years now. And if you remember from last year, he started to see very real signs in his short game. He gained at the Masters. He gained over or he gained two thirds of a stroke per round with his short game at the PGA Championship, then wins a few weeks later at the Memorial, gaining around the greens, also gained over stroke per round driving. And uh, and just had like just a, a, an incredible week all around. Was also great with his irons, phenomenal with the putter. Goes on to continue that considerably improved short game. Then he gets rid of the coach. Then he stinks for half a year. Then he rehires Mayo. And what do you know? He finishes third at the PGA Championship, gaining over a third of a stroke per round with his short game. I don't know what to think about Hovland this week, but I think you're a hundred percent right at the very least. We know that the ceiling is there. We know that if last week's Hovland and last year's Hovland shows up again, now that he's reunited with his coach, there are probably only two guys, maybe three 
with Scheffler, Rory, and Shoffley that would have a better chance of winning this event. Yeah, I, I just – and we talk about this quite a bit of guys that can just out ball strike you, mm-hmm. right, no matter what what you consider the number well, – you know, no matter what numbers you look at, right, of what's important. He has the ability to just go beat you. Um, I mean, obviously we're going to play Siwoo with putting down, driving. You got to hit it straight and he chips it really good. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be a, a huge believer in, in him this week. Um, he's also had some good finishes here. I think he was the leader after 54 last week, last year, if I remember. Last year, the year before he led after 54, finished like eighth, maybe. Um, uh, I think, real I, quick, an, another important point to make there is that when we talk about like the predictive value of each of these categories, remember that it's almost impossible for iron play to matter more than usual or even as much as usual when driving accuracy is this important because you can be the best iron player in the world. If you're not driving the ball well, you're not going to have a chance to show it on this golf course. The rough is too thick. The bunkers are too penal. So you have to drive the ball well first and foremost just to have a chance to gain strokes with your irons, especially to gain enough to like actually be in contention and potentially win. But if you are Victor Hovland, if you are Colin Morikawa, and you – can really rely on that part of your game showing up week in and week out, then of course iron play still matters a ton here, maybe even then more than usual. So it, it's like you can't quite capture that in the model, but I, I would still lean towards elite iron play being helpful above and beyond it. it's like typical amount if you are accurate off the tee, if you're driving the ball well. Yeah, and I, man, I, and I could be wrong about this too, but is did they not have this place playing silly hard the COVID year, like the, the yes, one year, like where it was just concrete everywhere, mm-hmm. the rough was long and wet and just like hard to hit it out of, but the greens were super brown and firm by the end. I just, for some reason, I, I remember one year this place just playing ridiculous hard. It played really hard last year as well. I mean, Hovland and Denny were in the playoff at seven under. That that COVID year, by the way, still to this day is my best single week DFS finish, 40K that week, uh, on the backs of Matt Wallace, of all people. So I, I'll always remember that one too. Uh, he had just this incredible putting round uh, on the final day. Um, that was, it was also the year John Rahm won chipping in on 16, I think, the par three. And they were like, there were guys who had been in contention who shot 83 that day or something. Yeah, it was like just huge completely. numbers. Yeah. And they got a little bit of wind or something the final round and with all the firm mm-hmm. conditions. Uh, I'd love to see that again. I, I, don't think, know uh, I think two years ago, by the way, I was winning like every single DraftKings contest I was in going into that Sunday. And Cam Young shot a million. Luke List shot a million. I think Benny Ahn shot a million. Like, like I had, I went literally from first by a million in every contest to min cashing because all my guys had atrocious Sundays. I think Cam Young shot 84, 86, something like that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because so, do, so a, a final round like that, does that hurt you the next year? So let's say that Cam Young gets back into contention and he knows he shot mm-hmm. 84 here. You don't forget that, right? You remember that. Yeah. But I also think, you know, that like, I've played so many rounds here. If I'm in contention, that means, you know, six of my last seven rounds here have been really, really solid. I just need to do one of those six instead. And you just like, as long as you don't start spiraling, the spiral never comes. The other thing that I'd say there is um, we also don't know exactly how difficult it's going to play this year, but one of the coolest stats, uh, Josh Culp at Future Fantasy does a phenomenal job every week of, getting us a a bunch of stats on the golf course This is the only course on tour to this point in the season. That's in the top third of both birdie or better rate and the top third of bogey or worse rate. So it's kind of just the nature of the golf course. If you're playing well, you can score like crazy. If you're playing poorly, you can shoot a really high number. Yeah. And, and I mean, this place is known for perfect conditions too. Uh, perfect fairways, perfect greens, uh, so that I, I think, and with small greens, you kind of feel like if you're hitting it good, you can make birdie on every hole, right? Because the greens are, I mean, they've got to be in the bottom third, bottom quarter of, of 
of total size, right, on tour. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure the exact number, but I know they're tiny. So I don't know. Um, it, I'm glad I'm glad you brought up Benny on there too because we know we know his ability, his short game ability, maybe not the most accurate, but we know he has the ability to hit it really far. Do you like a guy that you know is just going to bomb it up there, and even if he just gouges it around the green, his short game's good enough that he shouldn't shouldn't make big numbers? Yeah, so he he's one of the first names that came to mind in terms of like who might fit this golf course really well. Both his driving accuracy and his around the green play haven't been as solid of late as we often see. He's made up for that by putting better than we usually see from him. But the other guy, Sahith Thigala, uh, his around the green play has been kind of terrible lately. So he's another one that like I really expected to be on this week, and I don't think I'm going to be. Both Thigala and Benny on guys that we have backed a ton this year would have thought that this is a course for both of them, but I don't think I'll be on them. Yeah, so th I think Thigala is, is going to be a little skewed by last week, and and, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you watched and saw some of his struggles where maybe he didn't quite get rewarded for the shots that he hit and, and got a little bit frustrated, and, and you know, the give-a-shit factor maybe went down mm -hmm. a little bit and maybe didn't hit the quality of shots because he wasn't into the moment like, like he should have been. Um, I'm going to give him a slight pass. If I see the fact that he is going to go super low owned in this field and knowing his upside, um, I'm going to probably go to the other way here, which is, is kind of unusual because you're the one that usually leans into him. And I, I kind of am more reserved. I just think that his upside is so good. I, I think that the, the, the recent, you know, the recency bias there might be just the mental fortitude of, of paying attention to what he was doing. That's a good point. If he's really contrarian, I'll probably take the same stance. I, I'm kind of baking in an expectation that he won't be that contrarian because his ball striking has still been quite good of late. In fact, his iron play was really, really good going into last week. But like, here's his around the green play since the players lost three quarters of a stroke per round, lost 0.1, lost over half a stroke at the Masters, lost 1.4 per round at the Wells Fargo. Lost a quarter of a stroke at the PGA Championship. Lost three quarters of a stroke at the RBC Canadian Open. That's all per round. So it, it really has been kind of a disaster. And I, I think a lot of it is decision-making, uh, where he is consistently, like, trying the hero shot. It's like, dude, you can get it to eight feet if you just hit the normal shot. You don't need to try to flop it to the moon and hit it to a foot. You're a great putter. Like, just take advantage of that. Take your medicine and move on. And he keeps getting burned by it over and over. Yeah, I mean, it's a we, we we've talked about this. I think we compared him to Shoffley last week. Like it's a learning curve. He's going to mm -hmm. learn to understand these things, and yeah. and when it all clicks, he's just going to be better. The problem is he knows he can hit those other shots, right? So when you know you yeah. can hit those other shots, it, it just makes it it makes it that much it makes it that much harder to not try to hit them every time right. because you know you can hit them. Speaking of Shoffley, uh, some of the most top-heavy win odds that I've seen from our model, Scotty Scheffler, of course, leads the way 31%, even in elevated events, pretty crazy. Shoffley second at 13.1%. So that's 44% of the overall win equity going to just two guys. Rory's around 7%. Colin Morikawa in fourth. Speaking of course fits, I don't think anybody has done more this season to establish themselves as a great fit for Mirafield Village than Morikawa. We've talked about it previously. He was in the Hovland camp where like everyone always talked about his putter being the thing that held him back. His around the green play also held him back. It's been spectacular this season. He's driving the ball extremely accurately. Only Scotty Scheffler more accurate in our model off the tee. They are head and shoulders above the next best in terms of accuracy off the tee. So, I kind of love Colin this week. I hope he goes under the radar a bit as well. Yeah, and I don't think I'd be surprised if he does. He kind of is in that overlooked category right now because you have so many other guys that are playing playing so good. Can we talk about – I mean, I, it just is – it's so – 31% chance of winning. <laughs> it's nuts. 66.5% chance out of a top five, 82% chance at a top ten. These numbers are, we, are astronomical. What are we doing? Like <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but yeah, I, I, I uh, 
to uh, r- real quick to further contextualize that, he's easily first in expected driving accuracy. He's easily first in expected approach play, and he's easily first in around the green play. When have we ever seen a player clearly the best in the world in three out of the five categories? And and not just that, but just it. It's just how he does it too. It's mm-hmm. just so. I mean, just the colonial, like, just never felt like he was playing good. And then there he is, all of a sudden, just yeah. right in contention. Yep. Finished T3 or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's just – it's literally amazing. It, I, I don't even yeah. know any other way to, to describe it. It's just amazing. Yeah. I, I, I almost think he's not getting enough credit for it because, like, his quote-unquote off weeks – he gains 3.9 strokes or 2.8 or 3.2. Like his off weeks are good enough to win most PGA tour events. He's just been absolutely incredible. Um, So let's talk about that for a moment. What does that do for your DraftKings lineups? Like, do you want to start with Scotty almost like irrelevant of what his ownership ends up? So it's funny that that I was just kind of looking over that and in the way that the way that I kind of, the way that I determine that, right. Is, is where am I willing to go on the bottom of the board to make it make sense that I can put somebody yeah. with him, right? I need somebody sub 67, let's call it, to 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 put with Scotty to make it make sense for the build, right? Or you just save the money and go down to Shoffley, in my opinion, and then build from there if you can't find anybody down there. Brings me to the guy that, like, the first guy I saw that I was like, why is he down here? Davis Riley. 6,400 to Davis Riley. How many times does a guy have to win at 200 to one before they quit hanging 200 to one on him? <laughs> I mean, he's done it twice. He's so hard to figure out. Uh, obviously, um, one of the very highest uh, volatility players on the PGA Tour. He's near the top in both our event to event standard deviation and round to round standard deviation. I want to know what Riley's ownership looks like because if he's popular, that event to event standard deviation makes him like an obvious fade for me. And yet he's, he's not going to project well for us because he, prior to that win, he was playing some pretty poor golf, but he's such a good scorer. We know the ceilings there. So if he is really low owned, potentially go back to that. I also think Davis Thompson projects well down there. You can go up a little bit. Akshay, Kitayama, Lucas Glover, once again, projecting well. Glover, by the way, very solid fit. Super accurate off the tee, good with his irons, good around the green. Uh, probably going to be a, a target for me again this week, which is not much of a deviation for what we've done the rest of the year. Skipped And, and you skipped right over Justin Rose, which is surprising to me, just because no matter what the numbers say for recency, we know that this place fits him. We know he can play here. We also know he's – maybe on a bit of an uptick over recent years as well. Like he's, yep. he's shown a little bit better form throughout the year than, than maybe some of the other years past. So um, I'm going to be highly interested in, in um, highly interested in him as well. Moving up the board a little, you know, who is a great fit this week? Uh, how far up are we going? See, Wu is only 7,700. That's not that far. There you up. go. There you go. <laughs> what I had in mind. You knew it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, Accuracy off the tee, his iron play has been great. Around the green has been great. The putter continues to be an issue. But one thing that we we know, we've talked about a bunch, is like when you get on these really difficult golf courses, that's when the the poor putter can be mitigated a little bit. Again, uh, we we still want to f- follow the course fit model. It's The putting is a little bit less predictive than usual. It still matters a bunch. It is still a big part of the game. His putting has been disastrous. He's lost over a full stroke per round in three consecutive events. Is there any reason for optimism? I mean, I, when when you have the ability to strike it like he can, I don't know how. I, I just all all it takes is it doesn't have to. He doesn't even have to fill it up, right? He just has mm-hmm. to put average for a tour player. Um, when, when he puts average, it, it's a top twenty. Like 18th, 13th, 16th, the 16th of the Wells Fargo, he still lost over a stroke per round with the putter. 13th losing 0.3, 18th losing 0.1. Like you said, it just has to be decent. He's driving the ball so well. His iron play has been fantastic. He's got one of the most consistent and solid short games in the world. 
just he's gonna win everything. this year. He's winning this year at some point. You don't have a year like this without winning. If he can find the putter. Like we we kept saying that about Scotty, and he just wasn't getting the spikes until he got the spikes, and 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 then they weren't even spikes. He just like remembered that, oh, you know what, I can actually putt like this and and I can be good on the greens. I don't know when that turnaround is gonna happen or if it's going to happen for Siwoo, but man, if it does, it's like we could be looking at a guy who wins multiple times the rest of the year. We could look, we could be looking at a guy who finishes top 20 in every single event the rest of the year. But we could also be looking at a guy who misses the cut because he loses two strokes per round in the first two days. And yeah, just, um, so you, you, you skipped over Zalatoris there and I was surprised. Um, do you have any thoughts there? Because, you know, at 7,500 that, that probably fits to where he's playing now, but we all know that his talent is higher than there and his, and his ceiling is way higher than that price. Do you think that everybody kind of looks at it like I do and say, Hey, well, like that's just too cheap for a guy with this talent level. Or does everybody say he hasn't been playing very well. I'm just going to stay away. I do expect him to be low owned. He was really, really low owned at the PGA championship. Hasn't really done anything to, uh, to counteract that. My issue is that, he's been even more consistently bad than usual, both on and around the greens. And we haven't seen the dominant ball striking. I, I, I think the biggest concern for me is that his distance off the tee is still way, way down. Maybe that doesn't matter as much this week because we get such a high signal on accuracy and, and a lower than usual signal on distance. But that just to me says that he's not back to his usual ball striking self. Like it, if you look last year, he was gaining, 13, 12, 15, 25, 15 yards per round against the field, per drive against the field this year, plus seven, minus two, minus five, zero, plus two, plus two. He's a very different guy off the tee. And, and until I see that change, I also think that like that lack of speed is keeping him from being as dominant with his irons that we're accustomed to seeing. So, man, it's it's tough to back Salatoris right now. Yeah, I, I just he he's just one of those guys that I just feel like I could be ahead. If if you get a chance, we talk about it all the time. Of uh, we if you know somebody's talent is there, like can you be ahead of everybody else getting back to him? Tom yeah. Kim, I, I think Tom Kim fits that bill for me a lot too. Like he's starting to show some form. I don't know if everybody's picked up on it or not. Maybe a good fit here. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. As, as far as Alatoris goes. Now, I will say, like, if the rough's way up, um, you know, knowing the back problems, I might I might go away from them a little bit more mm -hmm. just because I know how hard it is to hit it through that long rough. Um, I don't know. I, I It was just an interesting – like, those two pricing, Siwu and, and Zalatoris, were the two that I was like, man. And then also, like, Norin from last week, like, way lower – just because he missed the cup. Mm -hmm. I, I love the Noren call. In fact, I was just about to say, I think the two guys who are the best course fits, the, the guys who project better here than they would on an average course or basically like any other course on tour, Alex Noren, Russell Henley, I'm going to have a ton of both of these guys. In fact, I already placed, I think it was, was it Henley or Noren. I can't even remember at this point. Uh, one of the two, whichever one that I got the, the each way on. Uh, let me let me double check which one it was. I want to say it was, I think it was Henley. Let's you know, let's just let's just check it out right now. Let's go but to the is, is, So if you build a lineup with those guys, like say you build a DFS lineup, is that kind mm -hmm. of one of those combinations that like if you're gonna play them, you're gonna play them together, or if you're not gonna play them, you don't play either one. You know, we talk about this a little bit, and they kind of fit that same bill for me. That if I'm gonna play them it's most likely going to be together because of the way that the golf course will play and for them to play, they both should kind of pop under the same conditions. Yeah. Um, do you, do you agree with that or disagree? I do. Their strokes gain profiles are unbelievably similar. They're, they're within a 10th of a stroke in every single category of each other, like 0 0.05, 0 0.07, 0 0.05, 0 0.06, and 0 0.03 strokes different. I, I've never seen two strokes game profiles that look more like each other. They're at 0.87 and 0.89 expected strokes gained. Henley is more volatile week to week, so he does have a much better chance of winning. He also has a lower chance of making the cup, but like they are they are extremely, extremely similar plays. So I do agree with you there. They're also only eighty one hundred and eight thousand dollars 
So it's not like if your thought with both of them is that, oh, I do think they could play well, but I don't trust either of them to go win an event like this. You don't need them to. They're 8,100 and 8,000. So I love them on DraftKings. I'm hoping they're not going to be that popular. I don't think they're going to be that popular, which means I expect them to be core plays for me. And uh, for the outright, it is Henley that I placed because he's at 5,000. So 50 to 1 with an each way on Bet365. You can also get 50 to 1 on Norin which I don't dislike, but in fact, you can actually get 60 on Norin, but the each way is down at 45. So I don't know for sure that I'll be placing that one, but for, as far as DraftKings plays go, I, I love those two guys as core plays, as long as their ownership's in check, which I, again, I expect it to be. Yeah. And, and they're kind of in that spot, right? If they get skipped over because of, you know, if they, if somebody is going all the way up to, to, to Scotty, especially, you, you you probably can't fit both of those in a Scotty lineup. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's just a it, they're they're both they're just both like I said. If I play them, they will be in the same lineup, or they won't be. Neither will be in the lineup. I like the call. Um, I think Spieth is also interesting in this range. Another pretty good course fit. Don't think people realize how accurately he's been driving the ball. His short game has been quite good. Another name in this area, Tommy Fleetwood. Fantastically accurate off the tee exceptional short game one of the more underrated short games in the world i think his iron play hasn't been that good but he projects pretty well he's he might be expensive enough where i have to start questioning the win equity but other than that absolutely everything about him is is something that i really like and i think he'll be pretty low owned this week what's your take on tommy i mean i i i honestly thought Last week, you know, you're, you got to be a little bit disappointed in the Sunday. Um, mm -hmm. You know, did you see the video on Tommy Fleetwood, by the way? We sitting like a five wood or a three wood. He had like <laughs> yeah, a high straight art. one. Absolutely art. I mean, like, I, I'm not sure that the common golfer, even for a PGA Tour player, how understands how good that was. It's and like, ridiculous. The, the the one out of the divot like the low cut out of the divot was just like yeah. it, it was just like it was just it's mind-blowing like how good it was and that he could i i don't know how many takes they did on it right this it could have been scripted and there was a bunch of takes for each one but it it, it was i it think was, it was one take i mean it was awesome yeah i'm trying i'm yeah. trying to find this video so all right if you google tommy fleetwood ball striking it's the fourth video down, not Google. If uh, if you search this on YouTube, um, the fourth video down is every shot shape with Tommy Fleetwood in the QI10 fairway metal Taylor made golf. Just watch that. It, it, I think it's one take. And one of the reasons why I think that is because Tommy is basically saying like, I, I don't know how I'm doing this every time. He, like he's impressing himself throughout the whole video. It's, it's, a, it's an awesome watch. It, perfect command of height and shape starting line and finishing line on every single shot it's an absolute master class and even spin like the mm -hmm. the spin and and mm -hmm. everything that it, it's I, I watched it in awe literally just watching <laughs> it in... i think i saw it on tiktok first and just like let it replay over and over and over again just like what am i watching uh, well, I, and that's kind of the first time you watch it. You're kind of like, you don't understand really what's going on, right? There were like on Twitter, there was no like big, like, this is what's going on. I just kind of clicked on it and he hit the one shot and then the second, like five shots in, I'm like, this is unbelievable. So anyway, uh, obviously he's got command of his golf swing and his golf ball right now. And, mm -hmm. and he's got confidence in what he's doing. Um, yeah. I think that he's going to be an ownership decision for me. Um, that being said, like, I feel, uh, and this might be dumb, but I feel like if you play him, you're just like, hey, I want to finish 10th. I don't want to win. That So that is that is my concern. I, like, I expect him to have a really solid GPP score, but do I play – you know, Tommy and Hideki or Tommy and Figala – or do I play Morikawa slash Shoffley, know that I'm getting significantly more win equity, and then just playing like a, a Siwoo Kim or somebody in that range? I feel like I'm more than likely going to say, you know what, Tommy's exciting, 
but he's less likely to actually win the tournament for me. So even though he's a solid play, I'm better off just going going up, getting either Morikawa, Shoffley, or maybe even all the way to Scotty and just getting that little extra bit of win equity. Um, anything else there? Uh, no, the, the only other thing that I was going to say was like, what what number would Scotty have to be for you to just be like, all right, I'm taking him off my board. Like, is there a price? Like 15000 are you just like, I'm out? <laughs> I honestly don't know. Here, I think the higher he gets, the harder the decision becomes because you know that he's going to get to a number where the field stops playing him, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God, he's $14,000, but he's also – 10% owned, like a 10% Scotty with a 31% win odds. I got to play that, right? So, it, yeah. man, I, I don't know what the answer is, but the the cool thing is I like the fact that DraftKings hasn't just left him at a price. Like, they actually brought him down to 12.5. So it's creating a, a like a different decision that we have to make each week instead of the same decision over and over and over again. So kudos to them for that. Uh, we also, once again, we don't have a $5,000 to six thousand dollar range, uh, the the yeah. low bound is six thousand again this week, which is probably why they brought him down. Um, yeah, they but, took away the bottom. They took away. Yeah. I think the elevated events they take away the five thousand mm-hmm. dollar range. Um, yeah. Also, did you notice they finally got pictures of everybody on DraftKings? I did hear that. I haven't seen it yet, but I did hear that. It's, it's so, fine. Yeah. It's about damn time. There, <laughs> there are a couple of, like really, really good players that didn't have a picture that needed one. And not just um, that, they would have different, they would have two guys with the same picture. It'd be like yeah. Cam Young, it'd be a picture of Siwoo Kim. And you're like, yeah, that's not Cam Young. One and done. We we are just outside the money still. Three elevated events in a row, counting a major, obviously, as an elevated event, which in one and done purposes, it's all basically the same with these huge, huge purses. What are your thoughts here? I mean, my first thoughts are Cantley and Hovlin. Um, I think I'm probably a coin flip between the two right now. Um, I, I think that's just kind of kind of where I stand on the. Um, I think it'll come down to ownership for those two. I hate I hate to say it, but I probably lean Cantley just because I think he'll go a little bit lower owned this week. Um, so, I'll be interested to hear your side of this, but that's just kind of where that's that that's that was the first two for me that just seemed to make the most sense. I'm significantly more interested in Hovland because I haven't seen signs from Cantley if anything. Like the the around the green play is is good, but he hasn't put it anywhere near as well as we're accustomed to seeing from him, which takes away a lot of ceiling. But the big issue is historically he's been one of the better drivers of the ball in the world. He's driving it a lot shorter than we're accustomed to seeing from him. And far less accurately. So I don't know what's going on with him on the tee, but until I see that turn around, I don't really want to touch Cantlay Hovland. I think you made some awesome points earlier. And then the other guy that I would uh, nominate, if you will, oh, we don't actually have Morikawa anymore. So no, we used him in somewhere in California. Yeah. So like, I wouldn't be totally opposed to to getting really contrarian with a Russell Henley or a Tommy Fleetwood, but I kind of think we're going to land on Hovland and, and feel pretty good about that. Yeah, so I did. I did read something. I wish I had the article in front of me. Um, I scrolled probably way too fast, but I did read something that Cantlay was going back to his old driver and his old driver shaft. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if that'll have something to do with maybe that uh, equipment change. Maybe, maybe not. That might be just uh, he's trying to gain some confidence back. Also, getting back to a place that you're really good at gets you way more comfortable on the greens. That's so. True. If you got a if you got a two percent Cantlay to a eighteen percent Hovland, like I just think if you eat the chalk with Hovland and it pays off, great. Um, but if you go super contrarian and, and it pays off, then you got a really chance to jump the leaderboard. I don't think that people are going to jump right back in on Hovland just from one performance. I think they still are going to remember what he's been for most of the season, but we'll see what ownership looks like. We'll make that decision down the road. Um, final thing there is regardless of how popular he is this week, if he does play really well again, his ownership is going to be high every single time he tees it up. So even if he ends up chalky this week, it might be like the the most contrarian that we can have a chance to get, to get with him for the rest of the yeah. year just because people haven't been playing him because he's been terrible. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, for sure, because 
especially like anybody that knows anything that he's going back to his coach and mm -hmm. it's really caused a spike. Um, you might get that. And then the other thing that, that might make him contrarian is everybody's going to see this huge spike from around the green play and know that he's not very good historically around the green. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that you could be right. Um, I, I just, there, there's just, some, and, and, and it, we, maybe we just wait to see some signs from Cantley because we know he's a world-class player. He, it's just when he gets back to being that way. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, the the only other thing that I could think of would be using Hovland next week, and the reason I say that is because almost everybody's going to be using a Deschambeau or a Kepka, and yeah. it gives you a chance to be very, very contrarian there. Um, yeah, just just a simple thought. We we also talked uh, on the previous show about one potential advantage for Hovland at Pinehurst is he won't have to chip. He might be able to just putt from around the green. So that could help him as well. With that being said, I think that's a very smart angle to think about as well. So we will kind of stew over that. And we'll, we'll give our final thoughts in the discord for FTN. Thank you everybody for tuning in. You can catch me on Pat Mayo's best bet show this week as well. So we'll see you there. We'll see you in the discord. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.